The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. We're not going to talk Tim about Tim Kelly, real one of the most politics. controversial <laughs> plein air painters of all time. <laughs> I'm just We're here to right address up. all the controversies surrounding Mr. Kelly right. and the excitement he brings to the modern plein air movement. I'm distorting in my headphones, so you know I don't know if that matters on your as long as the line feed's good. My head, I don't need to fix it. I'm just letting you know I was hearing the distortion here on the top. So as long as you're okay, I'm fine. Okay. This is like how it is to record a, 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 major, a major rock and roll album. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're ready, Paul. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Plan Air Easton podcast. Hello. I'm Tim Ligon. Hi, I'm Jess Bellis. Jess, we have a very special guest. No one knows who it is yet. How are we, we going to introduce this guy? Oh, my gosh. We just had a really great conversation with um, grand prize winning artist Tim Kelly. Tim Kelly. I remember when he first came here, he was playing guitar, you know, in the with the, you know, in the Avalon with his blues. So I don't even know if he does that much anymore, but like it was a great conversation with him. He's a down to earth guy, you know what I mean? He's got such incredible talent. And we, you know, one of the things that I like about Tim Kelly too is we did address straight on some of the Tim Kelly controversies from over the years. That's and right. I will tell this is an insider secret. We do ask everybody that we interview if there are things off limits that they don't want to talk about. And there are plenty of painters who have said, yeah, I don't want to talk about what is plein air painting. I've got to find out more about about what's going on behind these plein air eastern doors. But But I'm just saying, Tim Kelly, not afraid to go there. And um, he did talk to us from the parking lot of Popeye's, which I believe is a first. I was going to say. We should be reaching out to them for um, sponsorship. Yeah, he really does like Popeye's. This is Tim Kelly. (laughs) <laughs> we should have poured, poured cocktails and beer. Right. Yeah, that's right. We should have. We should have. <laughs> Dang. Um, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I am Tim Wagon with Jess Bellis. Hi. And t- Hi. And t- <laughs> today we are with, um, you know, I, I don't know, Jess, one of the great persons I've gotten to meet through this whole process. He's been coming here for a long time. He's won a lot of awards, played a lot of guitar. Grand prize winner, (laughs) Tim (laughs) Kelly. And the studio goes wild. UPS delivery man, blues player, Tim Kelly. Uh, (laughs) Tim, welcome to the show. It's really cool that you took time. I know because I know you're really busy. I I, I see your Facebook post and I post. We all see him and we know how busy you are. So thanks for taking the time to do this um, with us uh, today. Um. So I know that this is not where Tim wants to start, but it is where I always want to start. And it is like, how the heck did you get to be the artist extraordinaire that you are? Like, did you did you want to draw and paint since you were a tiny little kid? Is it something that was always inside you? Uh, probably, yeah. Uh, like most other artists, uh, I liked it as a kid. And uh, I was pretty good at it. And uh, I guess about ninth grade, it was right after ninth grade that summer, for whatever reason, my abilities and passion took a quantum leap. And it was then. Was there there a teacher? Like, why did that just happen? Like, you got you got bitten by a radioactive spider? He doesn't know. He can't say that's weird. He says he doesn't know. It spiraled in from the cosmos. That's all I can think of. But, uh, no teacher? Is there a weather system that blew through? <laughs> like, he, there's no... <laughs> it's, it's actually the universe coming to you. <laughs> his, his art teacher from ninth grade is just swearing. He's listening to the <laughs> yeah, podcast, right, so excited right. to hear what's up, Tim Kelly. And he's like, he's like, oh, my God, it was me, Tim. You don't remember me. <laughs> and his wife's, his wife's in the background going, see, I told you he wouldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden that summer you just wanted to draw or you wanted to paint like you were doing well, comic book stuff like what were you doing 
Well, yeah, I was, that's what I was curious. What were you drawing when you were a kid? Uh, drawing in a sketch pad. My father, he noticed, uh, he noticed that I had some ability and uh, went out and bought me a, a sketch pad and some supplies. And, and he was I like, spent it's better, summer... better than drugs. He was like, this would be better than doing drugs. Take this sketch pad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Got I was it. I was a goody two shoes anyway, but uh, good. That's beside the point. But um, <laughs> past like drawing, like a lot of sports figures, a lot of athletes, a lot of uh, seeing it's just a bunch of stuff, a bunch of uh, boy stuff. Yeah. And uh, it was that summer that I decided I'm going to try to make this my life, my my career choice didn't work out quite that way there was some detours but uh yeah it was between ninth and tenth grade is when uh it became my thing well it's interesting tim because uh there is you know again if you follow tim kelly on facebook it's if you're out there listening and you go to his page and he always has some really awesome paintings beautiful paintings but he also has some interesting posts and a lot of it sometimes is your battle with having to work a regular job to continue yeah. to. So, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, well it's all a trade off, Tim, because uh, the way I have it now is uh, I can't paint when I want, but mm. I can paint what I want, which is very freeing. If I was making a living off of the art alone mm -hmm. I would have to be jumping through hoops of, of I'd have to be painting somebody's you know deceased grandma or their golden <laughs> retriever and, and not, I'm just not up for that gotcha. there's no passion did you ever try to do that or you just always knew oh, yeah. that that you did and it just was it was sucking all the fun out of your passion sure it was yeah Gotcha. In fact, um, my my big career switch was around uh, 2003, mm -hmm. and uh, I became a, a CDL driver, a truck driver. Right. And at the time, I thought that I was giving up art. That I, I felt kind of bad mm -hmm. about that. I was a, a real rough time, real rough stretch of life, and. Uh, after making the switch, unexpectedly, I became more productive with making art. And the reason was because I was just doing it for myself. I wasn't chasing it. I wasn't chasing it commercially. Yeah. I wasn't worried about art directors or anything like that. I was just, I had the freedom to do what I wanted to do. And, uh, that's been the formula since then. I, I still drive, and uh, the reason is, is because I want to love art. I want to keep loving art. Right. If it became my job, it would be a job, and I, I would lose that kind of energy and passion for it. So it's a trade-off. I'd like to do more events. I'd like to do more traveling, but that'll come, you know, in a few years, that'll come. You've got the benefits and the stability. I mean, like you're working your way probably towards some sort of retirement or pension. And so it does, yes. it, it, I can think that that's all sort of academically or, um, you know, uh, freeing, like you said. I mean, you, you don't have to, the, the, the art can become the icing on your cake because you know you already have a cake. You don't have to be hustling for the ingredients to bake the cake. Right. I mean, I, I notice that at these events that uh, a lot of these artists are stressed out because they have to sell. Right. Cover their costs. I don't have to sell. I mean, it's good that I do. I like selling, but I don't have to. <laughs> right. Hey, UPS, I wanna, UPS I ain't bad. I want to back up, though. I mean, it's not like you just um, 
have a sketchbook from high school and that's how you learned to be the skilled painter that you are now. You, there was a fair bit of education between that moment yeah. and your like really um, proficient painting skills. Yeah, I went to uh, Maryland Institute College of Art uh, right out of uh, right out of high school for about a year and a half. Uh, and then I had to drop out for <clears throat> about five years and then picked it back up again. Uh, and graduated 10 years after uh, high school. So mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. of 82 in high school, class of 92 at Maryland Institute. Was the academic space a place where you felt growth and, and inspiration? And it wasn't until you were in the art workspace that you felt like the sort of constraints were suffocating? Or was the academic space a challenge for you too? I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't. Did you like school, I Tim? That's an unusual challenge. I mean, that's a challenge for anybody, but it wasn't an unusually difficult one. Uh, I probably given my artistic nature, probably would have been better served in like an atelier kind yeah, of sure. environment. Uh, Maryland Institute at the time, they, they still had some kind of like vestiges of tradition. Mm -hmm. So there was still some traditional drawing and painting instruction going on. And I got the benefit of that. Uh, right. I don't what they're doing there now. Uh, well, that was funny because that was one of the first questions when he was like, he said he was painting when he was a, a child or drawing when he was a child. Like, and you went to right to the thing, what were you drawing? And then I was just kind of curious as to like what he thought he'd be drawing today, you know, because it has changed so much, I guess, you know, maybe they're not doing the basics back at Micah anymore and, and, uh, uh, or the, or traditional stuff, you know, because. It is changing a lot out there. But um, anyway, um, Tim, I guess <laughs> he said he's a driver. And Jeff pointed out, like, are you in a van right now? Where are you, Tim? <laughs> I'm in my car in a, in a parking lot, in a Popeye's <laughs> parking lot. Uh, <laughs> I do love some Popeye's. <laughs> I do love Popeye's. Right. Because if I went home, uh, my grandson, he he's, he would interrupt. So it would be I, I, mayhem. <laughs> yeah, I would just I just got off work about half hour before the, this call started, and uh, I'm in a like a quiet space. So I, I, I love it. Right. Tim, Tim, do you paint every day? No, I, I, I'm streaky. I'll I'll paint every day for a while, and then I'll set it down for a couple weeks, maybe a month or so i i do when i have the opportunity uh i found that uh my work schedule offers some opportunities to paint uh because sometimes i'm idle I'm right just you've got downtime well, right waiting for it to know, load or whatever right yeah i have a backpack with a little thumb box and uh if I know I'm going to be stuck somewhere for an hour, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start painting. And uh, it's either that or take a nap. So, uh, <laughs> right, depending on how which, you feel, you which do are, one Which or the are other. both like really joyful like <laughs> things for him to do. So, you know, I wish I was that disciplined with using my downtime yeah. for things of joy. Um, I think that's really great life advice right there. Exactly. Um, Tell me about how, I mean, you, you, I obviously know you as a plein air painter, though I have seen a lot of the work that you have done in terms of like doing sort of replications or work that have, has been inspired by photographs. But do you, do you find that you like to paint in plein air the most? Like, is that really what you do the most or is that a misconception? Yeah. Cause you do a lot of, you do a lot of setups and that sort of thing and poses or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Painting from direct observation is is my favorite thing to do artistically, mm -hmm. uh, which is what plein air is. Um, now, outside of an event, I usually don't have the time or, or like the energy to do something really ambitious. 
with, with but you do a lot air. of plein air studies over and over again right i see you painting pick paintings of baltimore all the time i feel like it doesn't feel like yeah, all the time yeah, or is it fits and starts but yeah. those are studies tim those are more studies for you is that what well, you're saying when i paint plein air I, I paint with the intention of doing a finished painting gotcha uh in fact i don't think i've ever done a studio painting based on plein air work that i did mm. they're, they're always intended to be a finished piece gotcha now a lot of times they're not a lot of times i'll, I'll scrape them down or, or recycle them but the intent is to do something that's that could be on somebody's wall someday. Right. How did you find out about like the plein air painting competition circuit? Like when did that kind of come? How did you find your way to plein air Easton? How did you get here? Well, that goes back to about, I don't know, 2007, 2008, uh, I was painting plein air for one or two years at the, at that time, and uh, had was starting to get a like a supply of you know finished paintings, and I was shopping around to different galleries to see you know see if I can get some of those paintings in the galleries, and then one of them was a brochure of uh, of you know different art listings and. On the cover of the brochure was Robert Barber's painting of Masons. Oh yeah, our second that our grand wanted. prize winner. It was that, I think that that was our second year or our third year at Plenary Easton that Rob Barber it, won with that beautiful it, painting. It yep. that. And uh, that's the first time I knew that there was plenary events. So I, I like filed that away in my memory bank because that was I was too late to apply and. In fact, I missed like the next two or three years. I missed the deadline to apply. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time I got in the first time, 2012, by that time I had done a couple events. Gotcha. So, gotcha. gotcha. And it feels like, you know, I, I, I've known you for a while and you have a, a, a competitive streak in you for sure. Maybe that's the connection to your love of sports when you were talking about how you used to to draw a lot of sports figures. Do you really thrive in a competition setting? Like, is that what, do you really like competitions for that reason? Tim, 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 uh, Tim, 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 Tim. Just hold on to that answer, you listeners out there. We're going to find out Tim Kelly's answer. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back in just And you know what one... else we're going to talk about? Yes. We're going to hit him with all the Tim Kelly controversies. And I'm going to hit him with what's, what, <laughs> how, what, how's Baltimore, hon? We'll be right back in just one second. Hey, everyone. Producer of the pod, Nick Richards, here with a quick message from Plein Air Easton. One thing we've learned over the course of creating the Plein Air Easton podcast is the value that our participating artists find in the camaraderie and socializing opportunities that our festival provides. Painting can often be an isolating practice, but for eight days in July, our artists get to talk shop with others equally as passionate as they are. If you are a Plein Air artist looking for this type of opportunity to practice your craft with fellow artists, if you want to challenge yourself and explore new artistic realms, if you want to present your work to a large pool of eager collectors, then this is your year to apply for the 18th annual Plein Air Easton Art Festival and Competition. Over 58 artists will compete for over $30,000 in prizes. You can find more information and apply today through January 21st, 2022 at pleinairisten.com. I really hope to see you there, and maybe next year we'll be interviewing you on the podcast. All right, let's get back to it. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're here again. Uh, Jess Bell, Tim Wagon, talking with Tim Kelly um, from Baltimore. And we, Jess, just, we, we just asked Tim Kelly, not Wagon. Well, although I think that you both really thrive in a competitive environment. You're both sort of sports-oriented, and I feel like you're both – really competitive you're low-key competitive but you do both like to win i lose all the time though go ahead tim <laughs> tim wagon the loser and tim kelly the winner um do you think of yourself as being like thriving in a competitive setting or that's not a, a fair well it's it i don't know if it's so much competitive but it's it's more of like guidelines and like a uh, 
a structured setting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I tend to function better in a fu- in a structured setting. Mm. Uh, now, as far as the competitive element, <laughs> wait. Let's let's just or- time out. He's like, I thrive in a structured setting, except for when I have a boss and I'm working for the man, and then I won't thrive in that structured setting. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it has to be the kind of structure I like. <laughs> a, maybe a, yeah. a, a competitive structure. <laughs> it yeah. sounds that's, that sounds yeah, like- as far as the. the- the competitive aspect that was uh that was that was a really big thing when i first started because it was just a sense of trying to belong like trying to validate oh, okay. my there and yeah I, I was i'd be i'd be hung up on it um that that has diminished a lot he's like now that i'm a champion and, and a grand prize winner it's the, the stakes aren't as high <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm still buzzing on the endorphins over that. By the way, I love it. But, uh, but did you but, find? But did you find the planner community community welcoming, or was it clickish? I mean, I get the, I get the feeling of of needing to belong. But like, how did when you found yourself starting to compete? How did you find the planner community? Uh, I think that well it. I'm not good with mixing and mingling anyway, but uh, I made friends easier in in plein air than just about any place else in my life. Uh, I want to mention the name of of, of Bruno Baran. Absolutely. In particular, at my first event in Solomon's, uh, you know, we became instant friends, like as soon as we started talking to each other, we became instant friends. And it was kind of like through him that I got to know a few other people. And once you know some people, then, you know, you have it like an in, a conversational in. Yeah. And then, you you know, it spreads from there. So uh, now that's like one of the big calling cards of the events that's one of the big appeals is you know hanging out with time with, with time with your friends it's like summer i mean people have joked for years that you know plein air easton is kind of like summer camp you know you get to go and see all your friends yeah. once a year yeah. and really like focus on hanging out with them and you get to do all this cool stuff too but like you know yeah. some of it is just about being back in the bunks with your friends yeah yeah, and, and that's what you do when you look at the roster of artists that are going to be in an event. You're looking for the people you your you buddies, hang out. right? <laughs> Who am I going for a beer with? I got it. I got it. Yeah. Um, so, Tim, I do feel like on multiple occasions, and whether it is only at Plein Air Easton or whether it is other places, that some controversies have followed you. Why do you think that is? <laughs> <laughs> it's, I guess I it's not you, that. it's your art. And I, you know, like, um, but, it, but it isn't just on one occasion. I think maybe, I don't know, maybe social media might play a little role in that. Hmm. I don't know. Um, I don't know, but I, I kind of like it. To be <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think that you do have a very, like distinct painting style and people really do love it it does grab people's attention it has certainly grabbed judges attention over time um what do you what do you think about some of the rules i'm speaking about um several years ago for those listeners who don't know tim kelly really cleaned up and won i feel like 50 percent of the awards that we gave that year maybe it wasn't quite that bad but it seemed like um he won in every single category and certainly the rules of our competition provided that that was something that a judge could choose to do it was the only time that a judge made that choice um but it was it it made for a very interesting dynamic amongst the artists and i think it was it was really almost too bad because I think that it, it it was difficult for the person who did win the grand prize. I think that his work sort of got overshadowed in some ways by all of the other awards that then were given to you. It was just a really interesting strategy, but that the judge employed. But like, how did that how did that make you feel? Like, what the heck was that like? Well, 
while it was going on, it was it was kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I'm. You know, I know what the you know. Well, it's a very I've public been, event. I've heard I mean, announced like like uh, awards announcements being you know announced, and uh, you know I know how that feels when your name isn't called and you hear the same name a couple times, and uh, each time the applause gets a little less. <laughs> you know? I was just tired of hearing the same name. So I understood that, and it was a little bit embarrassing. Um, but now, you know, if anybody is still upset about that now. You know, <laughs> no, I mean, again, I, I think it is all about, like, you know, the the moment and the talk and the learning, and the, it, it certainly gave everybody plenty to talk about. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, well, um, nobody in the in the quote unquote firestorm that ensued. <laughs> nobody w- was like targeting me for that. Right, their, their fire was directed at the judge. No, and- I I even feel like we from a. I mean, I remember it very clearly, even from and like a, a, a admin or arts arts administrator standpoint, I really didn't feel like much of the visceral reaction to some of that or outrage was directed at me personally. You know, the, it, it, it yeah. really it really did all kind of rain down on the judge <laughs> for making that yeah. call. Um, but uh, yeah, nobody and the people complimented that the painting that got the awards they're saying it's not the painting it's not the artist it's you know that people just people just wanted the wealth spread a little bit no i I think it is and, and it's something that we have you and i have talked about and i've talked about with other artists you know it's so hard to create rules and and tell the judge that they have to spread things around because a lot of the judges are that. artists do and that. they don't want to be, you know, so, so, you know, it's like you sort of want things to be eligible for as many awards as possible. And, yeah. you know, it is, it, it is sort of difficult to figure out, you know, how many rules start overstepping, what should we really stay from a, from an organizational standpoint and that had never happened before we actually went through a lot of conversations with a lot of our artists and everybody kind of landed that they didn't really want us to change our rules either <laughs> um but you know subsequent to that time it really hasn't happened with another judge it was really a, a one-off and you because well, you even won an award at quick draw that year too right yeah yeah, he won. He yeah. won. Tim won like eighteen awards out of like twenty five <laughs> awards a year, and like that's what they're well, talking but, about. But and, and, so that, and, but and, and you also won the People's uh, Choice Award that year, though, didn't but, you? But I think the thing that came out Not of it, People's yeah. Choice, the Artist Choice. I pardon artist my. Choice. So you yeah. know, it, I think that even further right. complicated it. Right, it was Artist it. Choice because it was the everyone. artists, because the artists had all like universally agreed that your like second place painting was a strong painting. So it it wasn't even like they could be like. What the hell was the judge thinking? That painting stinks. They had all sort of said they already thought it was pretty good. Right. Yeah. yeah. No. And, and I, I think that with, going back to what Tim said, you know, at the beginning, it was like it's a little bit embarrassing. You know what I mean? Like it is. And, and because you know, the one thing that the Avalon did, it was it was strange for, as an organization because we hadn't had it happen, and everybody's like, "Wow, what's everybody going to say?" And you know, I think that Jess and, and Al and, and and Marie got on made up some questions to ask um, what the artists who were in the competition actually had to say about it. And I remember the comments the, the, the comments coming back were just like, what a great email to get. Thank you for so much for, for sending this. But in general, you know, um, we we think everything is great and it's just was a, was a was a, a year and again and more about the judge. Yeah. So um, I don't know what other controversies you've been in Tim in other places. I'm not well, going to get into them. Well, here, here's the last one. <laughs> so you can you can see if you go to plenaireaston.com that Tim Kelly is our grand prize winner for for 2021 and he painted just a really really spectacular oh, yeah. painting of the Avalon Theater and he had a, mo- a local model come and do at, at least one sitting inside the theater and um, pose so it certainly was a painting that was from life from direct observation 
Um, but I think it was really shocking to a lot of people that a painting that was created indoors could win the most prestigious plein air competition when a lot of people sort of are pretty vehement that plein air painting is only plein air painting if it is done outdoors. Whereas our rules clearly, clearly provide for the, um, for indoor painting to be, uh, uh, right. so, so, so just to set the record straight for anybody who's still out there grumpy about this, you know, Tim Kelly certainly followed our rules to a T. He did nothing that was outside of our rules and our judge did nothing, um, against our rules to choose it as the grand prize painting. And I don't know that every judge would have chosen it for that reason. I don't know. Well, I'll just, Tim, I'll just add this one comment and then hear what you have to say about this real quick. But like, I remember when uh, Garen Baker won for the um, for the guy who was on the uh, the boat. The crabber, and yeah. The, I, when, in the speech, the, the judge there said, you know, you can have as many co things as you want about all these paintings. He goes, but when I walked into the room, that painting popped out of 58 paintings that I saw in the room. He's like, yeah. and that was it. And I, when I saw the Avalon one, because I, I, I was, I went to go see it, and I didn't even really know. What, I just knew Tim had won. I didn't really know what he had painted. And when I went in there, I looked at it, and I was like, that is a beautiful painting. And I, it was, it was big enough. It was the right size. I think it was a great size for the wall. And I could imagine when he walked in there, seeing that and being like, it, it just popped off the wall. And that's. Uh, that's as fair a way to judge anything as you as you can be. If, if that's you know, uh, Tim, you have any comments on that? Well, I, I'm thinking about the, what the judge, what Daniel Weiss said, that in in his explanation that, um, and it didn't really occur to me until he said it that he 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 doesn't care what the artist intended. Uh, because once the artist has done the painting, once the artist takes it off the easel, puts it in a frame, and puts it on the wall, it belongs to whoever is looking at it. And whoever is looking at it, they they connect with it the way they the way they connect with it. And if it's something compelling, then that's great. And if it's different than what the artist intended, that's 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 no so big be it. Deal. right. Uh, so I think that um, I wasn't sure if I caught the uh, my what I was trying to convey in that painting. I I didn't think I was going to win with that painting. Be honest. In fact, I told Stuart White, you know, when they announced my name, I was like. Man, I feel guilty about this because <laughs> I I real I wasn't expecting it, and uh, so I'm just glad that it had that compelling aspect to it uh -huh. to somebody because uh, I, I I'm proud of him. It, it was uh, I put a lot into it, and I was really proud of of how it turned out. I just didn't think it was going to win anything. So I just, gotta that's always show. interesting. Cause we've asked, you know, I, I remember we, um, I, I interviewed, um, Sarah Linda Linda Poli a few weeks ago and I had asked her if she knew she's another grand prize winner like if she knew she had the grand prize like if she was like this painting kicks butt and she said she really did feel like it like she knew it was a really like she felt like it was the winner you know what I mean? And you're saying you did not, for this one, you did not have that gut feeling. I mean, again, right. you're proud of it, but you weren't like, right. oh, I nailed this one. You just were like, eh, it's another good show. It's another fun year at Plenary Easton. <laughs> yeah. You never know, because I have done paintings where like, oh, yeah, I got this. <laughs> I didn't get nothing for those things. So <laughs> never is. know. Well, I always you feel know. like I walk around there and I'm like, I'm like, oh, this one is a sure thing. That one is a sure thing. Or this one, these are going to be sold like this. And w whatever I think never goes either. So just know I've been doing yeah. it for like almost 20 years here and I still don't know yeah. a thing about how, how it's going to behave. Did you feel like you got a lot of grief about that painting being a painting from inside or were people more grumbling to one another than to you? <laughs> Uh, I don't recall anybody uh, 
addressing it with me. Now, is this is this the first you've heard? Wait, wait, is this there. right? I was like, is this the first you've heard of this controversy? <laughs> no, 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 I've heard about it. I heard about it. But uh, what's your feeling on Planar Tim? There was nothing hostile. It was nothing nasty or anything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Just, just a disagreement on, on like the terminology. What yeah. is it? What is it to you, Tim? Right. What, what? So, 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 can you? This is something that like most of the people we talk to don't want to talk about. But like Tim, Tim Kelly, what is plein air painting? Uh, as briefly as I can put it, it is a, uh, it is a response to a scene done on site. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't think you have to add anything else to that definition. It's a response to a scene done on site. It could be any kind of response. You know, it could be abs- you know, like uh, painterly, uh, you know, bright colors, anything. You can move stuff around, any kind of response. As long as you're at one site responding to what you see. Gotcha. That's what it is to me. Other people might have different definitions, and uh, uh, mine's no more valid than theirs. So, so how I much think. how much can a painting be modified after you leave that site, and you still consider it to be a plein air painting, provided you're still responding from to the experience that you had? Because this is another thing that I think, you know, we have a rule that says it has to be materially completed on site because we do sort of realize that you can get something back, for, a nocturne back from painting in the dark, and you could bring it back to the light and say, ooh. I need to brighten the light of that street lamp a little bit. And it seems stupid for you to get back in your car, to drive down, to set up your easel again, to brighten up that one little light. You know, I think that there, there's like some, some fair, re- fair and reasonable like leeway that has to be in there or people yeah. are just going to cheat. Like that's the other thing too. Like you, you've right. got to be realistic about how to approach a plein air painting, but like, you know, how much of it can you do when you get home to make it better and still feel like it rises to that standard? Do you? Well, I don't know how to quantify that because I've heard people say uh, 10%, but I don't even know how you would measure that. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, So it's one of those things that I don't think is ever going to be definitive, but uh, you're right. I mean, Sometimes you just have to correct something. You have to fix something. And uh, that kind of uh, leeway should be preserved because uh, in the end, what we're trying to do is create really nice paintings. Right, the best work possible. Yeah. Um, Do you ever find yourself, I mean, you have spoken about how this is like one of my final last questions I always like to ask people. I was going to say, Popeye's is like, wonder what this guy's doing. I know, they're going to call the cops on you, but we'll vouch for him. (laughs) We'll vouch for you if the cop, if the Baltimore police show up, put them right on and we'll talk to them. (laughs) But um, do you, you've spoken about how you are um, blessed with the freedom to be able to paint what you want, not always when you want, but that, that, um, your sort of day job provides you with a lot of artistic latitude. That said, do you find yourself ever just completely creatively blocked where you could put the paintbrush in your hand and you just like, don't really feel like you know where to start. And if you do find yourself blocked, how do you get yourself? How do you, how do you clear that? Like, what do you do? What's your method? Well, I haven't had that sort of thing in a long time. I did go through a really difficult stretch, like I alluded to earlier, like around between 1999 and, and 2003, where I, I went through a stretch, I guess about 18 months or so, where I didn't even doodle on a napkin. It was, it was just, just a, drained. It was, yeah, it was a bad time of life, and uh, how how to get out of that, uh, sometimes it's doing something creative that isn't painting, like uh, like building some models, like my father passed away around that time, and uh, he had some plastic models that were still in the box. He didn't yeah. put them together. 
so I put together some of these models, and, and it just got the... Uh, sort of muscle memory started again. Uh, yeah. No, that's Sometimes a... I have to, like, do, like, a... Uh, like an end around around the creative process. Do something that's creative, but a little different than what you usually do. Sometimes that'll get get the juices flowing again. But I haven't I haven't felt that in a long time. I, I've been I like it. At it with how, how when you do go to competitions, like when you go to Plein Air Easton, you you know you're obviously the grand prize winner. Say you have a, a free a free pass into twenty and twenty two. Do you do you know what you're gonna paint here already? Are you already scheming some of those paintings? How much of your competition work is like you're happening upon it versus you're like oh I'm gonna paint that bad boy next year? Like I got you. Like how much <laughs> how much is which? Um, I'd say it's about fifty fifty, but uh. I do have a couple ideas for for uh, next summer um, that I didn't get around to this year. Uh, that's the advantage of being at an event, you know, several times, knowing what's around, and uh, filing it away in your memory bank and and coming back to it. Uh, so yeah, um, I got some ideas on what I want to try in 2022 but then again sometimes you just go off on a tangent for example because like uh the, the uh interior of the uh avalon i've been wanting to do that for a long time mm -hmm. it's never came together until this past year mm -hmm. so sometimes an idea is there for a long time for several years well, on behalf on behalf of the Avalon Foundation, I want to thank you, Tim, for painting the renovation <laughs> <laughs> versus the old Avalon. Well, we all loved it. I'm sure you it was yeah, a reason no, to paint it. I was going to say it's a lot prettier now than if you had painted it when you first started coming to Plenary Easton. That's it's a great true. record for that us. That is, it's a great it's a great historical record. It's a great. How do you how do you feel like your painting is evolving and changing, Tim? Like, do you do you look at paintings that you did ten years ago and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm such a better painter now. Like, tell me, tell me about where are you going with your art, and then we'll let you. Well, but then we'll let um, you drive home. Yeah, the guy behind you is gonna be so pissed. <laughs> I've been a little, little bit more uh, uh, focused on uh, uh, different ways of uh, rendering perspective, um, and there's been a little bit of that in my work for several years, but. I, but it's something that I want to continue to, to uh, explore, and uh, that's that's risky. I'm also tending to work smaller, also um, doing a lot of six by eights. Yeah, it's, it's just I'm just energized and doing those little ones. I think and, it's, uh, I think it's a great question, Jess, because the one thing I'll say about Tim Kelly's paintings. As I've gotten to appreciate painting over the, the last how many every 10, 15 years, is that um, I always find when I look at a Tim Kelly painting from year to year that he's always gone a little bit deeper. Every mm -hmm. you, you know, like you know, he's like the there's there's instead of there being thirteen lines in the color of the light this year, there's sixteen lines <laughs> in the color of light, and it's accented with like something else. So I, I think it is a, is a is it, I don't know if that's what your your plan is, Tim. Is like, you know, just keep finding more to paint, you know, more detail, more whatever. Uh, it seems like that's what it is. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a never ending learning process, and, and that's what's so great about it because uh, always new horizons, always something else to explore and and challenges and all that. It's just a wonderful thing. Paint. I that feels like honest to God optimism, which I feel like I oh. don't hear a whole heck of a lot of these days. It sounds really <laughs> fanciful. It's a perfect ending for us. <laughs> there's there's always more. There's always more beauty out there to go it's get a, and it's find. A, it's a great way to lead into the holidays. Nick, can we get a little holiday music behind us on our way out here? <laughs> if it's on schedule, uh -huh. December 31st. Oh my gosh, this is it's gonna. He thinks it's gonna drop on December 31st, so we can say Happy, happy New, new happy Year, Happy New Year, everybody. <laughs> happy New Year, everybody. Tim. 
Tim, thank you so much for sitting and freezing in your car and, and talking to us. Um, we, you, you feel like part of the Plenary Easton family. You've sort of, um, you, you've been around and um, you've certainly been a trusted ally for me. You've taken my calls when I've asked, when I've wanted a, an artist's perspective. And I just, I value, I value you as, as a person and as sort of a member of the art community. I'm just really grateful to know you. So I appreciate your time this evening. And, and Tim, I value you as having lived in Arbutus, uh, <laughs> you know for about four or five years I value you as like the next door neighbor that I would have ne- met that was a UPS driver that I would have never known was a great artist awesome Tim well thanks for having me uh, Easton has my heart and I, I hope I think you know that but but telling the world Easton has my heart <laughs> you hear that he's on, hey, look, ladies he's off the market Easton has <laughs> his heart <laughs> just teasing <laughs> Tim, thank you for everything. We appreciate it. Get home, get home to your family. Order um some some, some spicy fried chicken. <laughs> yeah, and, uh... Get the chicken sandwich. I heard the chicken sandwich is great. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. We appreciate it. All right, have a good night. Bye bye. The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the Eastern Shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. The Plein Air Easton podcast is produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions, with additional episode music by Poddington Bear. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plein Air Easton at plenaireaston.com.